Good evening. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Caitlin. I work over in the kids section. Um, and I am incredibly excited tonight to introduce one of my favorite authors. Finally get to meet him, Tim Fredley, who stole my heart with better Nate than ever, and 5678Nate. And then um, Hickory Daiquiri Doc and Tequila Mockingbird. Literary cocktails, cocktails for the very young, or the parents of the very young, or not the parents of the very young, with a nice little twist. And of course, Tim is a former Broadway dancer and choreographer. And with great Lee, Tim Federley. Yes. My God. Small but mighty. I love you people, and I think I know every one of you. Um, we've got treats, we've got all the things we need to be drunk. Thank you so much, Caitlin. So this is the miracle of today's, come on in, uh, miracle of today's day, which is I've never actually met you, but I, but I know you from Twitter, and so I feel like in many ways we talk more often than I talk to my mom. Um, uh, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. So uh, I am Tim Fetterly, and I'm in Seattle. I landed this morning. I woke up in uh, my hometown of San Francisco today at 4 a.m., and my mom drove me to the airport because I was on live with, do you guys know Margaret on Channel 4? who interviews people, she's a lot of fun. And it was live, uh, and that was really fun, and I made cocktails at, for, at like 10 a.m., which is always which is a great way to kick off Christmas in a lot of ways. Uh, so uh, I am here because my new book came out, Hickory Dackery Dock, and I'm gonna pretend you guys don't know anything about Tequila Mockingbird. So this book came out April of 2013, and I do a lot of events now with kids because it's so great to see you finally. Because, uh, because I know so many people as avatars. I'm like, and now I recognize you in 140 characters. Um, I do tons of events with kids. And one of the things I'm always saying to kids these days is don't just follow your dreams, follow your whims. Because this book came out of a joke email to my agent. So I'll back up for a second. My background, because one of my only girlfriends of all time is sitting in the second row, Aviel Salkovitz. <laughs> We, um, we, uh, I just tweeted, I said, in sixth grade, I went with a girl, but we broke up because I was more of a loner. <laughs> um, and now she's at my event in Seattle. So I briefly lived in Pittsburgh, and I was like this theater kid, draw your deductions. And so moved to New York City. My first big job was I was a polar bear in the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. That's not a euphemism. I was an actual polar bear. And then, uh, and then I was in... Um, uh, Gypsy with Bernadette Peters, and I was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and I was in Little Mermaid, and then eventually I worked on this show called Billy Elliot. And uh, these kids were so inspiring to me that they made me feel like I have a story that I want to tell, which is autobiographical, and that led to my debut novel, Better Nate Than Ever. And that's when Caitlin and I sort of first started, I think, communicating on Twitter. Uh, I sent this email to my agent, though, and I said, do you think the kind of anthropology Urban Outfitters crowd would buy a book called Tequila Mockingbird, which would be literary cocktails. And she said, I don't know, I only sell kids books. Uh, but you should try to write a proposal. So I wrote this 10 page proposal and it went out. And I say this because we have like Martha's here, we have these great writers here. And I, I try to say this to as many people as possible. Everybody said no to this book except for one publisher. And it just went into its 12th printing. And I share that because it's, I think it's so important to remember in life with partners, with books, you only need one. Um, unless you're in like Utah, then you need like 10. But um, so ten Tequila books. Mocking, 10 books is what I meant by that because this is being broadcast. Uh, so, uh, so this book is filled with literary cocktails like Are You There, God, It's Me, Margarita. Um, this is my, it's my favorite cocktail in the book uh, because about a month ago it was a clue on Jeopardy, which I posted on Facebook since so some people saw that. Um, uh, it was a clue on Jeopardy, and it said, like, this this cocktail from Tequila Mockingbird, blah, blah, blah. And, and Judy Bloom tweeted at me afterwards, which was a lifetime moment. I actually retired, and tonight I'm coming out of retirement. Because I was like, Judy Bloom tweeting at you, how can you do any better? So, so this book um, is all Last of the Mojitos. It's all literary cocktails, and it's been super fun. I got on the road and met a completely different audience than I met with my kids' books, as you can imagine. I met their parents. Um, <laughs> And then it was actually, I was in Tampa at a really great indie down there called Inkwood Books. And there's a great bookstore owner down there named Stephanie Bedingfield. And she said, well, the next time you come to Tampa to do kids events, 
that night, like stay an extra night and let's throw, let's have a cocktail party, which was very smart. So I started doing these kind of two tiered events and my publisher came back to me and they said, do you have any new ideas? And I, right around the time that Tequila Mockingbird came out, I have an older brother and he, are there any parents in the audience? I know there's a couple, some parents. Okay. So, um, my older brother had a son and it was really stressful. And I think, you know, being just this sort of uncle who floats above and like entertains children and runs from them, I, um, I don't always deal with the sort of like the diapers and the bath time and like the traumatic moments. And so if this book came out of the fact that my mom had told me she has a book club where all they do is drink white wine, it's like, wait, there's an idea. Um, then, then this book came out of the fact that the year after my brother had a baby, like he never had more to drink. So I thought it would be really fun to do an appropriate, whimsical, I mentioned it to Margaret today on air and she turned to the camera and she was like, but of course drink responsibly. Like it made her really nervous. Um, but this book is all um, cocktails based on nursery rhymes. So I thought I would read a couple just so you could get a feel for what this is. This is, this is the first one. This is Rum a Dub Dub and it's illustrated by this really great illustrator named Ada Caban who I met yesterday, I'll tell that story in a second. So often people think that the authors and illustrators collaborate a lot and it was like, it never met her. So this is um, to sort of toast, it's obviously about bath time. So rum a dub dub, three kids in a tub, and how do you think that went? One soapy, one sleepy, and one just went pee pee, and now mommy's totally spent. So this is hot water, spiced rum, honey, juice of half a lemon, and, uh, and this is uh, hopefully going to evoke times when you weren't having mayhem in the bath, but rather something relaxing, like with cucumber eye mask. Um, uh, I lo I, this is John Jr. Jägermeister Schmidt. She's just, again, very highbrow. Uh, this is um, Eeny Martini Miney Mo. So there is this episode in my older brother's life where I realized they had not left my nephew Sam with a babysitter for like six months. Like they... They never went out. And so finally when they went out and left him with the babysitter, it was like a very traumatic night. Sam was completely fine. They were sobbing in the front lawn. So, um, so this is Eeny Martini Miney Mo. Watch out for the food she'll throw. If she hollers, let us know. Come on, hun, it's time to go. So, uh, so this is episodes in the life of young parents. And maybe I'll read one more. This is Ring Around the Rosé. I made this one. <laughs> on the air this morning. I, um, there, so I, I have another friend, and this is happening now because all of my friends on Facebook are just like exploding with babies. And I'm still taking like selfies with burritos. <laughs> um, but um, like awesome burrito and they're, they have six toddlers. So uh, a friend of mine said that they finally got out for a date night and that they both fell asleep at the restaurant. Like in between courses, it was like a really warm restaurant and it was like romantic and they were like, and they fell asleep. So I thought, this, so this is Ring Around the Rosé. Ring Around the Rosé, not allowed to doze. Hey, date night, date night, we all fall down. And this is um, Rosé elderflower liqueur and then you top it off with Prosecco and you put a little flower petal on top. Um, my, um, my method for coming about the drinks was, I, uh, it was sort of the same for both. I started with a title uh, and then from there I would, you know, ring around the rosé was going to definitely include like a rosé element. And then I would throw together my version of it and then I collaborated with this really great mixologist in New York who would say like, maybe we shouldn't put lighter fluid in the drink. Like he would, <laughs> he'd make it really delicious. So, um, so that was really fun. And then I actually need your help tonight because I'm writing a third book writing a book called, um, well, I don't know, that's why I need your help. So it's gonna be about movie cocktails, mm -hmm. cocktails with a Hollywood twist, and it's currently down to three titles. So anybody who has a brilliant pun I haven't thought of, like tweet them at me, you'll get a thank you. So these are the three that it's down to, knowing that it's gonna be more, sort of a companion, it's gonna be this same format as this one. So imagine like cocktails with a Hollywood twist and maybe like black with foil, kind of deco looking. So the three titles it's down to are Whiskey Business. Okay, giggle. Um, um, Gone with the Gin. Oh, okay, so far we have a clear. Um, and then a sidecar named Desire. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Seattle's so literary. I, 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 Seattle's so literary. I did this in two other cities and they were like, we don't, none of those resonate with us at all. Um, uh, so those three are what they're down to, but I've got also, and some of them are longer, like I'm working on an Indiana Jones and the Shirley Temple of Doom right now. But um, 
And I cannot believe this is my job. It's the most fun thing in the world that I just like go to the library and go like, no, not that one. That one's not good enough. And then today, <laughs> after the um, TV appearance, somebody like a, they were like cut and they turned off the camera and one of the ladies in the audience yelled Titanic, which I thought was really good. So that's gonna go in there, even though she heckled. Um, <laughs> so is there a, with a show of hands, if it were at the cash register at University Bookstore and you were heading to an Oscar party, would you be more likely to buy whiskey business, show of hands? Oh, interesting, interesting, passionate. Uh, literally shaking your head no. Um, just raise your hand. Uh, gone with the gin is... Oh, you changed your mind even though you yelled at me about gone with the gin. Um, or sidecar named desire. Okay, wow. Interesting, that actually changes everything. Um, uh, helpful. I want, to say one other, I want to say one other thing just about the illustrator, which is in the spring I'm going to London for the first time since I was the associate director of Sister Act, the musical, because eventually everything's a musical. And um, so I'm going back to London and I'm, I'm going to meet hopefully the first time this brilliant illustrator. She, this is the joy of sex on the beach, super appropriate um, for all ages. Uh, she's so brilliant and she did this all by hand. She's this British illustrator named Lauren Mortimer who, who's wor this is the Count of Monte Cristal. She's just incredible, she's so incredible. So I'd never met her and I think um, I have my first, I love that you have that on your lap, can I grab it? This is my first, this is how you know you have official book people in the audience. This is my first picture book that's coming out this April. Um, if you couldn't tell, it's in green. Uh, it's so bright. And um, Disney's publishing it and it's about a kid who, who gets into tap class uh, because he's bouncing off the walls otherwise. and. Uh, and, and, and likewise, people are always asking me, like, how do you meet your illustrators? Or how do you choose your illustrators? And, and my experience, did you get to collaborate much? Thank um, you. I genuinely no, although I have one who has been now sending me stuff, and I'm not telling anyone yeah. except you. Yeah, it's live tweet. No, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing. It's like they want your words, and then typically they want you just to like, go away. And so I've been really lucky because I get to collaborate a little bit. But it was really fun to meet the to meet the illustrator of my of my second book, and and then and then we're going back to this format for the third one. So we're going to get Lauren Mortimer on board. Um, does anybody have any questions about my unlikely journey from Broadway to Bourbon? Uh, no questions. It does. Yeah, no. It's, I appreciate that. Yes, in the front. Good to see you. Of Tequila Mockingbird? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's showbiz. It's terrible. Um, uh, a, a better Nate than ever? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the real truth about that story is that I told one person because I had felt like I didn't go to college and I had a real, my older brother majored in writing at Stanford and he studied under Tobias Wolf and he had this, and I have a dad who's super academic and he teaches at Stanford and I have a really brainy family, and I always felt like the kind of class clown guy, which you probably remember from school. So I was, you know, I always cracks me up when I do school visits now, and principals are like, welcome to my office. I'm like, oh, I know principal's offices. <laughs> uh, so I didn't share it with the kids at Billy Elliot because I felt like if I had told everybody that I was writing this book, and then I tried to sell it and it didn't sell, that I'd be answering the question for like, you know, forever. People go like, whatever happened to that book? So I was really quiet about it and sort of shy, um, which was rare for me. But yeah, I told one friend and I wrote the first draft of that book in a month. And what I would do is I'd wake up before Billy Elliot and I'd write a chapter and email it to my friend Sherry in, in California, in LA. And she would just, she gave me the best writing advice po possible, which is she wrote back and said, keep going. And I think so often in early drafts of things, you're, you're, friends while trying to be well-meaning give so many pieces of advice along the way that you start to sort of get into your head and she was the best possible mentor for me because her advice was just get to the end which is now what I say to kids you know when I ask young people at school visits what are your biggest writing challenges they always say grammar um, coming up like staying on topic and they start answering and I start going oh that's your teachers talking I can hear the teachers saying spelling or and you realize when you ask a group of third graders who are my storytellers, they all raise your ha their hands. And when you ask a group of eighth graders who are my storytellers, they're like, they're barely human, you know. In eighth grade. So it's so it's it's really interesting how that can get I think beaten out of kids. Um, 
so yeah, it took me a while to sort of come to it, but I didn't share any early drafts. But it's fun now. I just wrote a college recommendation letter for one of the boys who was in Billy Elliot. I was like, oh, we're all getting older. <laughs> Going to college now. Yeah, it's sort of shocking. Um, any other questions? Yes, hi, Andrea. How did you choose, like, and decide on the age of your audience for the Saturday Well, um, for me, it was really simple, which was I was working with kids 9 to 13, and that was the voice that was in my head. Um, I th so middle grade, is, we, this room knows this stuff, but <laughs> middle grade, middle school fiction was a fit for me then, particularly because every single day I was spending 10 hours a day with them. And the thing I love about middle schoolers is they're, they get every joke, but they're not jaded. And that combination of things is so unusual, and they turn like that. Um, but, but I love that about that age group. So I felt like I could tell a story without them being sort of dubious. Cause, and also, people still buy books for middle schoolers in a way that's slightly more robust than, um, than teens. Though with that said, I actually um, just sold my first novel, to my first YA novel to Simon & Schuster, which is going to come out in spring of 2016. So that's, I think teen might be a more native voice for me because I feel like I never grew out of my teens. <laughs> um, but but for, at, at that time I was writing for middle schoolers because I was around them. And I find that some of my favorite writers, when you research them, you realize you know, their books sort of grow with the ages of their own kids, which is such an interesting thing. You're like, oh God, you're writing for preschoolers because you have one, which is such an interesting are you Linda in the second row? Yeah, so Linda Perlstein here is this incredible reporter, and you, she wrote this book called Not Much, Just Chillin', which is probably, that's what it's called, right? And it's probably for sale here. And you're such a brilliant reporter. Again, we only know each other on Twitter, but, um, but I read that book when I started um, researching a middle school book because you spent, was it a year in the life of these middle schoolers' lives? It is so extraordinary just to get into the heads of kids at a certain age, you have to check out Not Much, Just Chillin'. I have that book on my like reference shelf. It's like my favorite. <laughs> Basically, I have a personal story about everybody here. Um, <laughs> I've dated you, I've tweeted at you, we had Thanksgiving together. Um, <laughs> mom? <laughs> uh, my mom and I last night got into a fight because she wanted, and now she'd kill me if she saw this, so we had dinner before my event in San Francisco and she said, I really, she made her brownies, and six different ways she tried to say to me, could I bring some refreshments? And I was like, I just, I, let's not make like a big thing out of it. She, okay. And then like two hours later she came back, she was like, I was thinking like people's throats get a little sticky with my brownies. Like she had so many different ways of saying I just want to bring water. And so finally I met her for dinner before the event, and literally sticking out of her purse were cups. Like that at some, at any point, if she just somehow like acquired a club soda, like Super Mario Brothers, like ding ding, and just, it just showed up, she'd at least have cups. So I'm really glad she's not seeing this, because afterwards she'd go, well, you know, Caitlin got you drinks. So I'm really glad she's not seeing that tonight. Um, any last, uh, any last comments or questions before we have cookies or, yeah. yes, young man in the back? Could you speak a little bit about how, I mean, the relationship in your first, uh, in uh, the Nate series, mm -hmm. uh, sort of your own voice in that and your own sort of like channeling, your, it's from your interviews. And yeah. It seems like, you know, there's some autobiographical components to that. How did you transform sort of yourself into Nate or, or how much is Nate his own individual sort of character? Yeah, how many people here are writers? Like how many people here would identify as writers? It's always this with that answer. It's the funniest thing. From third graders to adults, no one ever goes like this. It's the most interesting thing, like yeah, I write. Um, I only ask because uh, I, I have found that the only way I feel like I can write fiction is to write an alternate history of my own life story and then change the name so I don't get sued. <laughs> so, um, so like Nate is a really, he's a version of me. He's a version of me that did not have such supportive parents. And my way of channeling that was to wake up really early in the morning when I was still kind of exhausted. And I would, I I'm not a great outliner because if I outline too much, then if I know what's going to happen at the end, I'm like ahead of it and bored and you know, ADD generation. My mom had me on Ritalin like before it was cool. <laughs> so, um, so I don't do a ton of outlining. So what I would try to do is say like, this chapter is going to have three plot points. He's going to meet his aunt. Uh, he's going to lose his money at the pizza place, and then the rain's going to come. And if I knew I was like aiming for three things, then I could sit down for an hour and 
conk out like a thousand bad words. And, and my, um, not like swear words, like terrible <laughs> words. Um, and, then, and then my method for editing is just to try to get a complete draft and then print it out and then cut all the, Anne Lamott has this great thing where she's like, second drafts are like, cut the lies. Um, and then I went back. So in terms of just channeling my own voice, I think, you know, I had a fairly evocative background. And bullying is such a hot word right now. It's such a hot word. But uh, I sometimes do wonder if I did not have that thing to push up against, which was feeling like other kids didn't always understand me. I do sometimes wonder if I would have been able to find a sense of humor because, um, you know, I wasn't allowed to punch. I was terrible at punching anyway. So I found ways of fighting back, I think, with my voice, which I'm thankful for now. But middle school sucked. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to, this, I not have to, I'm honored to, but I'm giving this speech to the American Counselors Association this mm -hmm. July, so we'll workshop a talking point here tonight, which has to do with, um, you know, studies have shown, if you peak in middle school, it's all downhill in your 20s, like actual studies, like New York Times studies. If you are the kid in middle school who has it all figured out, then at 21 you become everyone's saddest Facebook friend. I mean, we have a school counselor in the audience. So because the, the, the way the... Way the um, Mom? Um, the way... Uh, the, the, I think the, the way schools are set up, it's such a hierarchy that if you figure out that world, which is so based on looks and status and things that the real world is as well, but. So in terms of parents, you know, I think a lot of it is, first of all, share your own times as a little Nate. My dad this is very achieved academic kind of guy, but he really blew me and my brother away when we were little when he pulled out his own report cards and showed us that he too had gotten C's in something, which to me was like my aspiration grade. But, but, uh, but it was like, oh God, dad is a human. So... Uh, the first thing I would do is to try to sort of share and show ways that you too went through those same years. Um, and the second thing to share is, is, and I really do believe this, that you don't, you'll never win over everybody. And one of the things I've started doing at school visits is saying, okay, tell me what your favorite movies are, because kids can always think of their favorite movies. Or I'll say, tell me what your favorite artist is, or tell me what your favorite book is. And then, I'll, and then the second round is I say, okay, tell me which book you could argue is the best book ever. And they go, Percy Jackson, or better hate than ever. Never say that. Um, uh, and then at the end I say, I turn on them and I say that I want you to go find one-star reviews. And I want you to bookmark some one-star reviews of the thing that you find perfect. Because you'll start to realize that um, the entire world is, critici is criticizable. And now in an era of comment sections, everything can be criticized. And I think for me, it took me so long to sort of find my own voice because I was afraid of being criticized. And I think if, when I was younger, if I had been told, oh, even your biggest heroes have been publicly criticized, I actually have a bookmark folder um, John Klassen's like, I'm like a, I idolize his work. He wrote, um, I want my hat back, Caldecott winning. He's like, he's, his, he's Dr. Seuss for a lot of kids these days. And I actually do not tell John this, but I actually have some of his one star reviews bookmarked in my writing folder so that I can remind myself that the guy that has been universally accepted as like the guy you go to for kids books also has one star reviews of people saying like, who publishes this dreck? Um, so you're part of a vast club as soon as you're criticized. But in terms of, um, but in terms of like kids who are bullied and who are who are discovering that they're different, you know, there's a really fine line between bullying that you have to endure and become stronger than, and bullying that you have to report. And that is a decision I think every family has to make. There are certain things that I stopped telling my mom what the other kids were calling me because I could see how sad it made her. But I had a counselor at school named Dr. Orr, who I'm still in touch with. And Dr. Orr was the counselor who was like, you are going to do terribly in high school, so come to my office, and I'm going to get you through. And she, like, coasted me through school. Um, it's really about finding allies, I think. And, and also about finding, like, just one or two. Because I think kids have this image that someday they'll be friends with everybody. And I wish more adults would share with kids that, like, we're winging it, too, <coughs> every day. I mean, I always say this. I feel like I'm still make, I'm st waiting for the day that I feel like an adult. Last night before the event, my mom was like, are you going to tuck in your shirt? <laughs> um, and I was like, no, uh, mom. And we're not doing beverages. Uh, so, 
<laughs> so, uh, I, does any of that resonate? Yeah. You gotta find people, what I used to say to the Billy Elliot boys, so um, I'll, I'll wrap this up in a second, guys, but we, Billy had a younger friend in the show named Michael, and he's played by these really flamboyant, great kids. And this boy, Jake, today is actually turning 16, I saw on Facebook, but he was nine when I worked with him. And Michael had to do this cross. So the, did anybody here ever see Billy Elliot? Um, Huge theater town. So, um, so Michael had this cross where he'd go, what the hell's wrong with expressing yourself? And he'd have to go from like stage left number 18 to stage right number 18. And it was like a huge flamboyant cross. And if you're a nine-year-old boy, eventually you realize that it's going to be an overwhelming and silly thing to do in front of 1,400 people. So we started, I didn't come up with this concept. It was the choreographic team. We would say, who is your biggest, like, favorite, like who do you idolize as a pop star? And invariably these boys would go like, Kelly Clarkson, they'd never say like, Tom Petty. And, um, and so we go, okay, do it like Kelly Clarkson. And I have to say, I found that a lot of my early success was about faking it and acting like people who I thought were more confident than I was. So sometimes it's about going like, I want you to channel that Kelly Clarkson. So find that thing that Milo resonates with. Find that thing that your kid or kids, if you work with them, the people who they think, I have a, I actually have an adult girlfriend who before she negotiates contracts, she listens to Beyonce and runs around Central Park. And she's like, what would Beyonce ask for? <laughs> and, I, and I think there's that thing where you put, you fake it till you make it. And then I tweeted this recently, fake it till you make it and then you keep faking it. And I think there's this thing where you, it's the imposter syndrome thing, so. Um, but we can connect if I can help afterwards in any more personal ways. I think a lot of times it's truly just admitting that adults are trying to figure it out too. I mean, share the presidential approval ratings. Share the fact that more people vote in American Idol than, let me get my cane and wave it. Um, <laughs> you know, you're never gonna win over everybody. And I think the sooner people can identify that, oh gosh, winning over everybody is not the answer, um, the more you can start just figuring out what your own voice is. So great segue to cocktails. Um, any last questions before we have some Reese's Pieces cups and some pineapple juice and whiskey? <laughs> um, I'm of course available to, to, to sign all of my titles this evening. Um, uh, Christmas gift, baby shower gift, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and, uh, and if there's no other questions, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. And come up and get a drink and some refreshments and give yourselves a round of applause for being such a great audience. <laughs>